Most people have heard of Errol Garner, but very few people know about his life and his journey. Let me tell you about this guy, Errol Garner. He's always been in somebody's shadow. From the moment he was conceived and at his birth, he was in somebody else's shadow. Namely, his twin brother, Ernest. <laughs> yep, they came out at just about the same time. So there they were, the two little babies side by side. And of course, there were already four kids in the family. Older brother who had been born six years earlier and three girls. Um, everybody in the family received piano lessons, except for these two little twin boys. <laughs> El Garner didn't get any piano lessons, but his big brother did. We'll come back to that story a little bit later. So uh, little Errol had to go for himself. Yeah, he had just figured it all out. So somewhere around the age of three, he just started tinkering with the piano. And people noticed something about this little kid. It seems that whatever he heard, he could play. So then someone must have made the decision, well, you don't need piano lessons because he can play anything you hear anyway. And so that was the end of that. He never learned to read or write music. Never. Never. What he did have was photographic music memory. Even going to a classical concert where sonatas are being played and concertos are being played, he could go home and two hours later reproduce exactly what had been played on the stage two hours earlier, just from this and this memory and those wonderful ears. So he must have also had perfect pitch. If he hears it, he knows exactly what note that is. And it doesn't matter how many notes there are or how fast they're coming, he got every single one. This worked for him very, very well. Because as a little kid, he made such astonishing progress that people forgot he didn't read music. Didn't matter, he sounded good because after all, you can't hear a piece of paper. You can hear what's being played on the piano. He was in a group called the Candy Kids. And they actually had a little radio show featuring the Candy Kids. And Errol Garner was the chief attraction of the Candy Kids. And this is early in his life. He's still a kid. Yeah. By 11 years of age, he's playing on steamboats or riverboats that go up and down the Allegheny at 11. Still can't read music, but he can play anything he hears either with his ears or with his mind. He can play it. And he can pretty much tell you what to play. So he's also becoming a band leader. Or he's got people who are learning to work with him and anticipate what he's going to do next. Like his bass player was with him for a long time because they kind of knew each other. And Errol needed that flexibility. He needed that partnership. By the time he was 16, he's playing in a small combo led by a saxophone player. Well, he's in his first band now at 16. Things are going really, really well for him. He's starting to play concerts. He's playing here and there. He's doing this thing and that thing. He's starting to pick up some gigs. Meanwhile, his brother, Linton, the older brother, he's also a great pianist. And he's already left town 
and is playing around the country with just about everybody from Fletcher Henderson to Colin McRae to Dizzy Gillespie, Billy Eckstein, singers loved him. Linton eventually moved off the American scene. He crossed over into Canada and never came back. And that's why we don't know more about him. But he was in his life in America much more popular and much more acceptable than Errol. And he was also the range of composer because he could both read and write music. Errol did not let that hold him back. Somewhere around 1944, he got up the nerve to go to New York. And he started playing and making friends and getting a little fan base. And ended up making his first album in a friend's apartment on very simple equipment. The friend just started the recorder and Errol started playing. And after a year or so, this was released I think five different recordings, which is the other thing. Errol loved to play, and he was very, very prolific. He was a small man, not, not real big, five foot seven or so, five foot six, and happy, just very cheerful fella. And he made everybody around him feel good, and I think this happiness in his spirit came through his music, which endeared him to a lot of people. His style was very hard swing, like the big bands. He did a lot of block chords and things like that, you know. But he had some other little things, uh, like uh, Father Hines. He could do those octaves with that right hand. Matter of fact, his publishing company was called Octave Music Publishing Company. He, he really had the octave thing going, which he had taken from uh, Father Hines. Um, he had this thing that people call gas pedaling, uh, where you actually keep a tempo steady with your left hand, but your right hand can play in and out of that tempo. It can play behind the tempo just slightly, or it can play right with the tempo, or it can just get ahead of the tempo a little bit to create more tension, more relaxation, more bluesy behind it, right with it for just regular time, regular swing, and then getting ahead to create more edge. He could do all that. He had great technique, even though he was self-taught. But you see, when you can hear everything and reproduce it immediately, everything you hear becomes your method book and the world becomes your conservatory. And that was what Errol Garner had going with him. So he started playing in small groups. He actually did a recording uh, called Cool Blues uh, with Charlie Parker, with Bird in 1947. By this time, Bird's already got Miles in the band, Dizzy has moved off doing his thing, and Errol Garner comes in and plays with Bird. So even though Bird was dealing with bebop and all kind of advanced harmonic structures and all of that, and even though Errol could not read music, he had no problem figuring out those advanced harmony, those substitutions and things like that, because anything he heard in his spirit, he could play immediately. And it's really important, 1947, Cool Rouge, you might want to check that out. Uh, Charlie Parker and uh, Errol Garner. He was not so much of a bebopper. We give him credit for bridging the gap between the nightclub and the concert stage for jazz musicians. Jazz was the domain of the ballroom in the swing area, swing era, and the nightclub, speakeasy, in the bop era. And later it became like, okay, we'll put some big band, Benny Goodman, people like that on the concert stage, bro. 
Aragona helped move that pendulum forward. In 1955, Carmel, California, he recorded his concert by the sea. By 1958, that album has sold over a million copies. And in 2015, it was reissued with 11 additional tracks. As I said, this guy is very prolific. I heard an interview that uh, Errol did immediately after that concert where he talked about how beautiful it was to just sit and play extended pieces and do all the things he liked to do and not be limited to the two minutes and 55 seconds that radio limits you to. And since we're talking about radio, let's talk about it. One of the shining stars in his compositional toolbox is a tune called Misty. Obviously, it's a ballad. So although he could swing real hard, he could also play these really, really nice ballads. His popularity in the 40s actually increased because he was recording standards in the American songbook, like Summertime, recording songs like that. And um, when you record songs that everybody likes, you put your own spin on it, you attract more followers, and that's what he did. So by 55, he had a lot of followers. And I have talked to people who will say without any hesitation, that their favorite jazz album of all time is Errol Garner, Concert by the Sea. In this interview, he's talking about how beautiful it is to play extended pieces, how beautiful it is to just sit and just improvise a kind of a segue between pieces and nobody knows where he's going, but the musicians, when they get a certain musical cue, then they know what the next song is. He likes that whole mystery, that little joyfulness, that little playfulness, because after all, he was a happy guy, humorous guy, and he brought that joy to his performance. He continued to, to make music right up until his death. And four Grammys, NAACP, Image Awards, all those kind of accolades are his. But the greatest accolades are the 75 recordings that have been released and counting because they were still releasing Errol Garner's unreleased works in 2016, 2017, 2018. And the word is with a new partnership that has developed between his original publishing company and a new publishing company called Downtown Music Publishing, there's going to be more editions published, both in print and in recording form, both for download and on CDs and even vinyl. So Errol Garner is immortal. He is going to be with us forever because his music, like his person, lifted the spirit and continues to lift the spirit of everyone who listens to him. And remember, this is the kid who didn't get music lessons. This is the kid who was always in somebody else's shadow. If it wasn't anybody but his twin brother Ernest or his older brother Linton. But this is a guy that, despite all of that and his demure little statue, became a giant among jazz musicians, pianists, and shall we say, just human beings. So once again, high on a hill in Pittsburgh comes another giant, Mr. Errol. Lewis Garner, thank you very much.